Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I'm here for my LPL placements week number three overview and analysis video. We are getting towards the back half of these group stage placement, you know, kind of games here, and I'm really excited to be able to say that we are getting a much clearer picture of which teams are going to be good, which teams are going to be bad. A couple of these groups do feel like they are at least a little bit decided, although I do think the field is a lot more open than maybe people were expecting it to be. There are quite a few groups that are very much not decided, or maybe Maybe are decided in ways that you would be surprised about, you know, teams locking themselves in for, you know, upper or lower groups that maybe you weren't anticipating, and so I'm excited to go over all of it today. Of course, a lot can change in week number three. You can't really afford to drop games at this point. There are just not enough games left for you to be able to recover if you go on a cold streak, and the difference between getting into that upper group and that lower group might be one or two games, and so very important that these teams are on their A game, but if you want to know my thoughts on everything that's happened so far in the LPL split, if you want to know my thoughts on how things have gone up until this point of course check out the playlist up in the iCard right now that's going to have my primer video before the split it's going to have week one week two all of that in there so check it out if you are interested but without further ado let's jump right into it if you are new to the channel what we're going to do here is go series by series talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate I'll be giving a player of the series and a dud of the series for each individual series that we cover and at the end of the video I will be giving a player of the week and a dud of the week to kind of tie everything into a nice neat little bow of course we will also be updating my personal personal power rankings from number one to number 17, and you'll kind of get an idea of where that lands in each group, respectively. A lot of teams are either going to be qualifying for the upper group if they're in first place or qualifying for the lower group if they're in last place by the end of the week, and so we'll have a better, clearer idea of where these groups are starting to shake out. Not that we don't already have at least some idea with how the teams have performed halfway through the regular season here, but, you know, we're going to get some concrete information by the end, so I'm excited. I hope you guys are as well. Without further ado, let's jump right into the analysis, and that's going to start with day number one. Group D basically kicks us off every single week, and so kicking us off is once again going to be Group D, and it's a very, very important matchup between Weibo Gaming and Ultra Prime, and just like in the first round, Robin, Ultra Prime is going to pick up a very, very big victory here. They're going to move to three and two. They are going to win 2-0, which gets them to 500 in terms of their game score. This is massive for Ultra Prime. Likely speaking, you know, depending on how the rest of this week ends up going, these are going to be the two teams that are fighting it out for that third spot out of Group D, and for Ultra Prime to have picked up wins in both of their matchups against Weibo, it's just a game changer, and especially because this is a 2-0, remember game score could matter a lot, especially if these teams don't perform super well down the stretch, if they have similar records or the same record game score would come into effect there, and so a 2-0 actually really matters a lot for Ultra Prime, and they are really starting to play well. They found an absolute gem down in the bot lane. Nicket is going to get my uh, player of the series here. He is ridiculously good. He has absolutely no business being as good as he is already. I know that people were a bit critical, me included, maybe not critical, but a bit confused why you would swap off of Dway uh, and just go to Nicket. You know, you already had a really promising, like, talented young support who really didn't have a lot of experience at this level. You ship him off to Rare Adam and you bring Nicket in, who is, uh, in our minds, you know, as analysts, essentially the same thing, a developmental project support, but it has become very clear why they made that decision. Nicket is incredibly good. Like, this guy's already an upper half support in the LPL. He has dominated every single game that he has played. He's been super valuable in every role, whether it's as an engager, whether it's as a Braum here in game number two, he's just been incredibly valuable, and quite frankly, he outplayed one of the best supports in the league in this matchup, and there's a lot of talk about Weibo Gaming. Trust me, we will get to them. If you followed the channel, you probably know where the conversation is going to go when it comes to Weibo Gaming, but you gotta give a lot of credit to Nicket because he really was excellent here, and Doggo was also very good. Doggo's been inconsistent, but the talent has always been there. It's never really been a concern about whether or not he can win in the best-case scenario. The problem has always been that Doggo doesn't feel like he makes his team better, he certainly can't be a number one or a number two option on the team, but if you have a support like Nicket who's playing super well, like he is at the current moment, then Doggo's a good enough carry and a good enough player to be able to follow up on a lot of those good plays. I still see him very similarly to other players in that tier like 1XM, like Assume, that get a lot more credit than someone like Doggo gets because Doggo had higher expectations, but I think he is that kind of player. He is somebody who with a good situation could probably do some damage, but isn't really going to make the team better just on his own. But when you have a good support who's playing incredibly well, uh, like they have right now, then he's going to look really good. Also, Hacker looks awesome. Hacker's been really good in 2024. I know I've talked about it a lot on the channel, but very sneakily, he has been, you know, a very interesting jungler. I'm not going to sit here and try to say, like, one of the best junglers in the league or anything like that, because the inconsistency is still there. But he's won a lot of games for Ultra Prime. Even when they were bad in the spring split, he has done a lot of good things for this team. And I really do think this might be the most consistent year of his career. It's certainly, in my opinion, the most consistent year since his E-Star days back in, you know, 2020 or so. So really 
nice to see Hacker playing well. Uh, Ching Tian goes deathless. That's important. Breathe just got outplayed in the top lane. That's huge. Yuakai was solid here. Xiaohu couldn't keep up with him. That's a little bit more expected because of where Xiaohu has been over the course of this split. But Ultra Prime genuinely looks like a good team. I've had them in my top 10 ever since week number one. That looks to be a pretty good decision, at least for now. And then for Weibo, man, things are just not clicking for this team. There are going to be a lot of, you know, fingers pointed, a lot of blame put on a lot of different players. I think that, you know, Tarzan's going to receive a lot of it, not only because he's an LPL jungler, because generally speaking, LPL fans just scapegoat junglers. As we all know, it doesn't really matter what else is happening on the team, but also generally because Tarzan just has this reputation of either you were defending him a ton or you were yelling at him a ton. You can't really be neutral on Tarzan, which I think is a very weird place for a lot of fans to be. It's either, oh, you know, I feel vindicated because I said that Tarzan was going to be a downgrade or alternatively, I defended Tarzan and now it's not working. I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I certainly don't think Tarzan has been the biggest problem on this team. As I've said over the course of the beginning weeks, I think Tarzan will get a lot of the blame because, again, like I said, uh, the narrative just kind of necessitates that. He wasn't great in this series. I'm not going to try to defend the performance that he put out here. I just don't think he was the worst player on the team. In fact, I, I don't even think he was even close to being the worst player on the team in this series. That could fall to a variety of different players. I'm going to give Dead of the Series to Crisp. You know, I'm a huge fan of Crisp. I think people just forget how good he was last year. I know the world's performance was a little like, oh, you know, he was kind of dragging Weibo down and they made finals in spite of him or whatever, right? I still think he was good in their wins. He just wasn't very good in their losses. But when you look at why they were at Worlds in the first place, I think a lot of people forget that they are not at Worlds without Crisp. Like, he was the best player on Weibo Gaming for basically the entirety of 2023 up until the World Championships. And so, you know, I'm going to defend him. I don't think he's been quite as good this year. He's not been that all-pro caliber guy. He's definitely still been good. He's just not been elite, right? And this is another performance where Weibo just feels off. Crisp was looking for a lot of engages in situations where it didn't feel like the team was with him. He was getting caught roaming. This is what happened happens when you're a support for a team that just has no communication or is disconnected in some way. We're seeing this in a lot of other regions. Vitality comes to mind in terms of a team that makes the same kinds of mistakes where it's just communication problems. If Crisp was on the same page as Tarzan or as, you know, Zhao Hu, then I don't think these mistakes happen nearly as frequently, but he doesn't seem to be on the same page, which is a bit of a problem. Breathe got destroyed. Cheng tian has been horrible this year. He's easily been Ultra Prime's worst player. He's lost lane super consistently and has not really generated any pressure on the top side of the map, and Breathe has been good, but this was not how that matchup ended up going. It feels like his performance is now suffering because of team morale. And Xiaohu has been like one of the worst mid laners in the LPL over the course of the summer split. He has been truly atrocious for this team. And that is incredibly concerning. Light is still light. He got caught out a little bit more than maybe you would anticipate, but Nicket was that good in this series. Weibo Gaming just feels off kilter. I don't really know what this team needs to fix because it, it is clearly just a synergy issue. These players are talented enough to win, but they are all playing worse because they are playing together. We were concerned at the beginning of the year that there was no true carry on this team, or at least no one with that, like, I'm going to win the game mentality. We were hoping that would be Breather Xiaohu, but it's not really been either, and Weibo is really suffering because of that. They are below 500 in real danger of uh, going into the bottom group, which would be a disaster for them. And then for Ultra Prime, best case scenario is that they finished top three here. That They could have never anticipated that in their wildest dreams. This team didn't really make any noticeable changes, and yet here we are sitting here, a team that was one of the worst in spring last split, and they're actually doing incredibly well. Really happy for them, but they got a, they got a close it out. It's not free from here on out. Then moving on to our second series here of day number one, and we're staying in Group D, except going to the top of the group as we saw Anyone's Legend taking on Ninjas in Pajamas, and AL is going to pick up yet another victory. It feels like that they are just kind of cruising to being the best team in this group. I think that was not out of the realm of possibility in terms of what we talked about in the preseason. It's not what I predicted. I thought NIP and Weibo would be a bit better, but AL being good, like, trust me, I'm the last person that is going to, you know, be against that or not have expected that if anybody has followed the channel, they know that I overrate AL every single year, and they underperform. This is finally the time where my hype for them is starting to pay off, at least for now. This team looks really, really solid. They look very consistent. Basically, across the board, they know how to win. Now, sometimes they look a little bit lost in their losses. They're not a very good team at playing from behind, but they're talented enough where they can get consistent leads against very good teams in the league, and that's all you really need. It doesn't really matter if you're super bad from behind. Look at a team like Fnatic. Like, no offense to Fnatic, but look at someone like Fnatic over in the LEC. It doesn't matter that they're not very good 
from behind. They very rarely ever have to play from a negative state. They never really get tested in that way. And AL is kind of similar over here where their talent is just enough to kind of push them through. For Ninjas in Pajamas, they are really starting to get exposed. I think Fearless has hurt them a lot more than it's hurt a lot of other teams. I think the top side of the map in particular has really been affected by Fearless Draft, but we'll talk about that when we get to them. Player of the series is going to go to Shanks. It's so funny. Like every single series we talk about for AL, Shanks is the first person we always bring up because he's either the best or the worst person in the series. Like when they win, he's amazing. When they lose, he is complete garbage. And it kind of just is what you have to live with with Shanks is that his mechanical talent is going to put him, you know, in company that is a little bit of a high expectation. Sometimes he'll live up to that. Sometimes he won't. I saw WE fans on, you know, social media be like, how dare we give up uh, Shanks for Fofo? Like that's a pretty crazy thing to do. First of all, Fofo has been exceptional for WE over the course of this split. He has been one of the best mid laners in the LPL. But even outside of that, Fofo is significantly more consistent than someone like Shanks, even if Shanks is way better. I think that that is kind of the way to put it. Shanks is way more talented. He's got way more upside when he wins. He wins way harder, but Fofo is not going to lose in the same way that Shanks does. You just kind of have to live with that with Shanks as a player. But when again, when he wins, he looks so freaking good. He was going into Rookie, who is the heart and soul of Ninjas in Pajamas. We'll say that at the very least in this series. And he was excellent. Clear choice for player of the series. An amazing game three on the Yone. That's really the one that stood out for me. But he was great across every single game. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to Croco. He had a really good game plan in this series. You know, shout out to the coaching staff. I think that obviously they've done a great job here on AL, but Croco's plan throughout basically this entire series was let's gank Rookie. Let's gank Rookie over and over and over again, because if Rookie gets behind, we don't feel that Ninjas in Pajamas can beat us. We don't feel they have enough firepower elsewhere to beat us. And they were kind of correct in that Aki was actually able to get Rookie ahead in game number two. And so we're not going to sit here and say that it was perfect, but games one and three, it was a very good game plan. Game three was a disaster disaster for NIP. Krakow just completely destroyed the middle of that matchup, and Shanks was really able to snowball out of control. So credit to the mid-jungle. I think they had a really good game plan. Kale was kind of a part of that as well, just a part of those three-man dives in the mid lane that just made Rookie unable to play the game. Hope was fine. All A was definitely the better top laner, at least the more stable and secure top laner, which is all you really need him to be. Just generally, I would say a good series overall from AL, and they are top of the group by themselves. They're at four and one. Teams like Ninjas and Pajamas, they're at two and three. Like Weibo Gaming's at two and three. Ultra Prime's in second in this group after day number one. Pretty crazy to say, but for NIP... Their problems from last split are starting to be exposed again. This felt like a spring split loss for them and the fact that Rookie was kind of their only win condition. You know, Photok and Juo have not been nearly as good as they were in spring, which complicates things even more. But the big problem for Shanji and Aki is it just doesn't feel like they're very good on these champions that they have to go to in games two and three. Like the Renekton from Shanji was horrible. He's going to get dead of the series because of it. Now, I do want to say Shanji's actually been much better here in summer than he was in spring. He was a, a real liability in the spring split. He was by far the worst player on this team. He was holding them back. He's been a lot more stable in summer. Even when this team is losing, he typically hasn't been. The problem, this was just not a good example of that. This was probably his worst series of the summer split up until this point. And Aki was very good in game number two and, you know, tried his best to get Rookie ahead in that one. But in game three, he got completely outjungled by Krako. And I think you could say something similar in game number one in terms of the tempo that he offered. Aki, another player that does not play particularly well from behind, that just doesn't win in a losing situation. He doesn't know how to play safe. He doesn't know how to gain resources at a slow pace to try to keep his team in the game. He will lose his team the game, and we kind of saw that a bit. But again, Ninjas in Pajamas really is Rookie versus the world. If Rookie gets ahead, this team can win almost any game, but Rookie has not consistently been getting ahead. When he wins, he wins hard, almost harder than any other mid laner. It's why he was my second team all-pro mid laner in the spring split. He was excellent there as well, and he's been good in their wins this split, but it's just not been nearly as consistent. His ability to actually get ahead has not been nearly as strong. Now, AL had a good game plan against him. I'm not going to blame Rookie for this series in particular, but NIP is very predictable and I think they are starting to really suffer because of that. So they got to figure something out soon. But for AL, this is a nice win. Shanks looks excellent. Again, he's just got to keep it up consistently because he'll have bad games every once in a while. You just have to hope that the good outweighs the bad with him. And, you know, Krako needs to stay on pace. He is so important to this team. He was really good in this series. But if those things happen, AL can actually be a true contender. And then moving on now to day number two here in week three, and it is really just kind of the epitome of how this team season is going, how they performed here. It's LGD Gaming taking on RNG, Royal Never Give Up. And LGD wins once again. They moved to 2-2. Two two. They're 500 in this group and both of their wins coming off of RNG. This is just not a good team. Like, there is nothing else left to say. RNG was dropped to number 17. Last place in my power rankings by the end of last week. I thought that they were, you know, by every definition, the worst team in the LPL. And all they have done is reiterate that through their play over the course of this week as well. This was horrible. They are 0-4. They look completely inept. This team is not going to go anywhere if they continue to play like this. I do 
do feel bad for the player on this team that is playing well. Not the players, I should say. The player on this team that is playing well. Shout out to Juan Fong. He's absolutely trying his best. But everybody else in this team is just absolutely horrid. They're not playing well. They are making a lot of mistakes. And, you know, I'll kind of get into where I think this team could theoretically improve moving into the future. But for LGD, they might actually have a shot to get out of this group purely because of just how poor RNG is. Like, how free their wins are against RNG. They look okay. They actually look pretty good right now. They looked pretty good in spring as well. I thought that they would fall off. I didn't think they would be nearly as relevant. I was a bit wrong about that. They're basically exactly what they were in the spring split, which is a team that can beat teams that are completely off kilter, not playing well, not comfortable at the current moment, but they're probably not talented enough to actually be able to go up against a lot of other teams. They just have a lot of tools. They're, they're sound, and honestly, their bot lane's playing pretty okay, which I think really is going to be the difference maker for LGD. That's what held them back in terms of my rankings, but even when they were doing well last split, their bot lane wasn't very good, but now they're actually playing pretty fine. So we'll go ahead and talk about it. Player of the series is going to go to Meteor in the jungle. I've never been a huge fan of Meteor. I think especially in Fearless, it's not really an ideal situation for him as a player. Somebody who is a little bit one-dimensional in terms of his play style. He really only plays carries. He can't really play anything else. He's gotten a bit better on things like Sedge and Maokai. You know, those engagers, you know, if he has to be a little bit of a low-resource player, he's better now than he was, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, per se. But he's still not a very versatile player. And there are going to be a lot of situations in which he's just not very valuable. But when you give him things like Kindred and Karthus, you know, that's going to work out. You just got to ban those things against LGD. That should be the first thing off the chopping block is, you know, they they took the graves and that's great, but you got to take Kindred. You got to take things like Karthus. You got to take things like Brand off the board because if he doesn't get those, he is a significantly worse player. Meteor was allowed to get them and he looked great. The Karthus game in particular was really the one that stood out in game number two. That champion is ridiculously strong right now and obviously Meteor showed that off, but I think Haichao was also very good. I think he was probably a bit more consistent in terms of the mechanics. Haichao's just awesome. Like, this guy's really, really good at League of Legends. He's been in a really good place across 2024. He's kind of taken that leap. I'm not going to say that he's an elite player, but he reminds me a lot of these other players that have been on bad teams and then gone to better situations and been very talented. Someone like a Shanks. I think he might even be more consistent, if not, you know, a little bit worse mechanically, right? I'm not trying to say everybody's better than Shanks. That's not the intention of this video, but Haichao is a very good player. And I do think it's worth noting that he is somebody that I think could win on a better team. And you know, could actually contribute at a really high level. I think Xiaoya played really well in this series. The Zeri, the Twitch, if you're going to go late game carries, I think that fits how the rest of this team wants to play. Meteor does like a lot of the resources, so maybe you're not going to get a lot of attention down in the bot lane, and Haichao obviously is going to be someone that's going to try to pressure the mid lane, but uh, if you can scale into the late game, if you can be consistent in the front-to-back 5v5 without really needing a ton of early game resources, I think that will be valuable for them. And then, you know, I see a lot of hate on Bertle. Like, I know it's regular. I know it's Reddit. It's basically just Reddit that really shits on Bertle. I want to make it very, very clear. First of all, I am high on Bertle. I think Bertle is a good player. He was excellent in spring. He was really good for Live Sandbox in spring of last year. He just stopped caring in summer. The only reason anybody has anything negative to say about Bertle is because he played for Damn One before he was ready. If Bertle was just a top laner in the LPL, I think people would actually really like him. He reminds me so much of like Prime Cube in terms of how he ends up playing like Rare Adam Cube from 2021, where he's just this super valuable top laner. He's just more talented than half the top laners in the league. He's never going to be a star. He's never going to be somebody that goes up against the best in the world and dominates them, but he is super valuable. I think he fits into the camp of like Wayward and Morgan, these players that were, you know, put in situations where they just weren't ready. They were not, they were put in too big a situation too fast into their careers and ended up having their brand and identity suffer because of that. Again, I think if Bertle just was a completely different player, I think if this LGD stop had been his first, or if that Sandbox stop in particular had been his first stop at pro play, I think people would really like Bertle. I think if you just watch the tape, he's a really solid player. People just don't like him because of the damn one days. They are preconditioned to not like him. This is a talented player, especially in the LPL, where I've talked about it frequently. LPL top laners are not good. Like, this is not a deep role in the LPL. You've got, like, six or seven good top laners, and everybody else here is just not playable at this level. So um, Bertle being, like, the eighth or ninth best top laner in the LPL is pretty valuable. And he absolutely destroyed ZDZ, who, on the flip side, is going to get dud of the series. He's bad. Like, he is really, really bad. It's, it's becoming even more evident that RNG had literally no brain when they swapped Breathe for ZDZ, that this was one of the worst moves that they could possibly make. Breathe is a very good player, and I get that Weibo is having their own problems, but ZDZ is so much worse in terms of the mechanical ceiling that he has. He is just not a good player at this point in his career. There have been times where he's looked okay. I think a lot of that is because Zhao Hao is a really good jungler and has given him opportunities to look good on the top side of the map, but now that he's not with Zhao Hao, he doesn't really have anything to do. He's not winning solo. He's not useful He's not useful in the late game. He's just not a very good player, and it's not like the rest of this team is doing better. Uh, Wei was really poor. 
Gengar in this series. Certainly the worst of these two junglers. Wei continues to be overrated by RNG fans. Ming continues to be horrible. Genuinely one of the worst players in the LPL. Tong Yuan was fine in this series. This might even be one of the more consistent ones that he's played over the course of the season, but Haichao was certainly still better, and Huan Fong is trying his best out there to do literally anything. He is the only player that is even doing anything remotely good on RNG. This is just a horrible team. They are the worst in the LPL until proven otherwise. They're 0-4 and 1-8 and and in a group with LGD. That should prove that enough. And then for LGD on the other side of this, you honestly are in a pretty decent position purely because of RNG. If you can scrape out a win against a team like WE, that's huge for your chances of getting out of this group. You might even be a team that makes the top group here, a top two in the group stage. So that's huge for LGD. They continue to overperform expectations, overperform the talent level on their team. And I think that that should go to the credit of the, the team and the staff. And then moving on to our second series of Day 2, and we're sticking with Group B, except moving to the top of the group. It's Billy Billy Gaming taking on Team WE, and BLG picks up their fourth series win of the split. They stay undefeated, and they move to 8-1 and one in terms of their game score. It's not quite been as clean as that would indicate. That, that would kind of show you that, oh, this team is, you know, just as dominant as they were in the spring split. I think there's been a few more hiccups. I say quote-unquote hiccups. Like, this series itself was relatively interesting. Game 1 probably should not have been won by Billy Billy Gaming, but at the end of the day, WE had the worst player on the Rift, and that ended up causing their demise. Bot gap was just a little bit too large in this one, and BLG was able to to take advantage of that. I don't, again, think they have been quite as dominant as they were in spring, maybe not as dominant as you would have anticipated with them being Billy Billy Gaming and, you know, one of the best teams in the world, but they've certainly been good enough. If 4-0, 8-1 is your floor, like if that's like you performing poorly, then I think you're doing pretty well, all things considered. But let's talk about it. Player of the series is going to go to Elk. Like I said, the back gap in this series was just ginormous, especially in the back half of this series. I want to give credit to Bin, who I thought was really good in this series, and we'll talk about him in a second, but Elk really was by far the most important important player for BLG. They don't win these games if he's not popping off in the back half. Elk has actually been tremendous in this run for BLG. He has been by far the best player so far in summer for BLG. He's going to be an MVP front runner, depending on how the rest of the quote-unquote regular season ends up going for him. He has done everything he needs to do. This is a meta that I think fits him well. It allows him to play some things that have a lot of mobility options, either that or, you know, champions that just have a lot more utility that can still do a lot of damage. You know, things like Jin and Ash are very good right now, but so is Ezreal, so is Kai'Sa. As we saw from Elk in this series, so you know, I think he is going to be kind of in, in his own element in this kind of meta, and I think it's very much working out. Fearless also helps him out a lot because he is a very versatile AD carry who can play quite a few different things, but Elk is excellent. He has been excellent all split long. I'm not surprised to see him dominate LP and Mark, who are just not good enough to go up against him. Like I said, Bin was also very good. The scoreline doesn't indicate that maybe he was as impressive as you would think, but he was very important towards this team's success overall. Knight was good. I know people are going to criticize the Malzahar, but I think generally in Fearless, Malzahar really isn't all that bad. There aren't a ton of things that can punish it super heavily, and if you have a player that just wants to play for the team, if you want to lock down, you know, something so that, you know, Kha'Zix and Kai'Sa can really blow it up, even the Rumble could blow it up, then that's great. Like, Malzahar does that just about as well as anybody else in the mid lane. I know it gets memed on for being a super low skill intensive, you know, character. It's not a champion that really requires a ton of execution, but those are the kinds of champions that you want to see played at a high level. Like, I would never fault a team for picking the thing that's easier to execute than the thing that's harder to execute. Like, yeah, it's awesome to see teams do a lot of crazy cool things, but if you want to win consistently, do the thing that's going to give you the best results with the least amount of effort. That's always got to be the strategy for the best teams in the world, so I'm not going to criticize that. On was excellent. Shun was pretty good. I still want to see Shun play a little bit better. He's really not done anything to convince me that he is not going to be the same player that he was at MSI, which is a player that does really well against bad competition and not as well against good competition. I'm still a bit concerned about him, but everybody else on this team is so talented. There's really only, like, such a floor that you can hit when it comes to BLG. I'm not concerned about them at all. And then for WE, they're just so close to being a really good team. Like, they are they are right on the cusp of being one of the better teams in the LPL. Fofo is playing out of his mind right now. The dude is genuinely playing like an MVP caliber mid laner. People are not going to tell you that because, again, Fofo is another player that is kind of predispositioned to be disliked, although in his case, it's a lot more justifiable. But uh, Fofo has been excellent, like truly one of the best players in the LPL in terms of pure performance so far in the summer split. And I'm a fan of Wayward. Uh, I don't think he was particularly strong here, and he's not ne been nearly as good in summer as he was in spring, but I still think he is a positive player. Even Hang has been 
kind of a positive for this team overall. Very risky, very aggressive player, does not know how to play the mid game at all, but, you know, will generate advantages for the team. The problem is this bot lane is just unplayable. Now, it's not Mark's fault. I honestly think Mark has been generally fine. He has not been the issue here. LP is not good enough. He is dud of the series. He has been uh, an absolute disaster for WE. He's had one series where he's looked even competent. He got beat by Juan Fong. Like, RNG's bot lane was beating WE's bot lane in the 2v2. That is how you know things are not going well. LP just looks lost for this team, and, you know, who could have seen that coming? Again, I, I hate to brag on this channel. It really feels annoying, and I know I get comments all the time that are like, I liked your videos up until you started talking about how good your opinions are, but I think it's important to recognize the things you do right and the things that you don't do right. I get plenty wrong on this channel, and I talk about those things all the time. I talk about the takes that I get wrong, but, you know, I get a lot right. I get a lot more right than I get wrong, and LP was certainly a good take for me, just as, uh, you know, LWX and a lot of the other 80 carries that I've been low on have been good takes for me as well. LP is just not good enough here. I think a lot of people are like, oh, he's Prince for this team. I think he's way worse than Prince. I don't even think it's remotely comparable. Like, Prince was not good for this team. He underperformed a lot in terms of the expectation. It was clear that he didn't have very good synergy with Iwandi in the bot lane that they wanted to do entirely different things and that the team wanted to go in different directions, but at least Prince was surviving 2v2. Like, you could give Prince a lot of flack for not carrying games, for not being all that relevant in the mid to late game, for essentially just being the most passive AD carry in the league, and I think that that's super justifiable, but LP is just losing. Like, he is just giving over resources super consistently, and it's making WE not competitive, basically on its own. ADC is too important of a role right now for you to be losing as consistently as LP is. This team is not going to be a contender with LP in the bot lane. I, I moved them up to number five because Fofo was playing that well, and, you know, Hang was kind of more stable than he was in spring, and, you know, Wayward, I think, is a player that I'm expecting to do better, but LP is just too bad. Like, this team can't be top five with LP as an AD carry. It simply just isn't doable. For Billy Billy, they're going to be happy to move to 4-0, and but the rest of this group is really open. WE moves to 2-2 two and two now. That's the same record as LGD. The middle of this group is not set in stone by any metric. We're going to see that matchup later on in the week, and it's going to be interesting, but uh, it really does feel like this is the weakest group in the LPL, Group B, and I think Billy Billy is definitely benefiting from that. We'll just say that. Then moving on now to day number three, and we're moving back to group D to start off. It's Ninjas in Pajamas taking on Invictus Gaming, and NIP does pick up a victory here, a 2-0, and they do absolutely slaughter IG, which is obviously super important for them. They needed to get themselves in a good position in this group. They needed to get back to 500 in terms of their results. IG is the perfect remedy for that. Uh, they've had moments where they've looked relatively competitive. This was not one of them. This team got absolutely slaughtered in this series, and I know IG fans out there are like, oh, there are interesting pieces on this team, and yeah, I, you know, Nenny is someone that I think could theoretically be interesting as a mid laner moving forward. I think GLFS has upside, like Zuyan has upside. He had a good series earlier um, this year, but there's just not really a lot of stability here. I'm really not sure there's a lot of actual talent here in terms of 1v1ing ability. These guys are getting absolutely destroyed in lane, and that's a bit more of a problem than, you know, what we've seen from younger teams in the past and maybe some other regions like the LCK, where they're able to survive in lane, you know, the mechanics are able to hold up and then they move into the, the mid game and the late game and their their communication and their ability to play the map is just so much worse than the actual good teams in the league. That would be a little bit more understandable, but IG, when they lose, they just kind of get obliterated, which gives me less hope that these players are actually good and, you know, less hope that they could develop into something so... I hate being pessimistic about IG, but it's just kind of where I'm at with them. For NIP, you know, it's a really good win. You absolutely destroyed Invictus Gaming. You needed this kind of bounce back after losing to AL earlier on in the week, but uh, you still need to do a bit more. I, they're going to be in a pretty good spot to get out of this group at 500. Again, you know, teams like Weibo Gaming, Ultra Prime, you know, they're going to be fighting with NIP. Only one of those teams is going to miss out on the upper group. NIP just needs to, you know, keep doing their thing, and they're going to be in a pretty good spot. But top side of the map was really good here. Basically, everybody was really good, but Aki is going to get my play of the series. That Lee Sin game in game number one, by far the best game in this series. I think the Sejuani was obviously also very good. I'm not going to try to criticize that. He had very good tempo and, you know, the Viego was never in it at all, but he's getting player of the series for that Lee Sin game in game number one where he was everywhere on the map. He was constantly just destroying everything IG wanted to do. Aki was very quietly pretty good this week. Like, he was pretty good in that series against um, uh, AL earlier on in the week. He was he was pretty okay in that series. He wasn't the problem, and he was good once again here, GLFS. Just not the kind of jungler that I think can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aki, who, when he does get on champions he feels comfortable on, is able to dominate. And this was another good performance of that. Shanji was also excellent. Zuyan was not nearly good enough on the other side of this matchup. Shanji obliterated him again. A really important bounce back from him. Outside of that series previously in the week, he's actually been much better here in summer, and that's a very encouraging sign. This 
team was able to win in the playoffs and get top four without Shanji being particularly good in the spring split, I think they could do a lot more if Shanji does start to step up, but a lot of that was also predicated on Photo Kanjuo kind of taking that next leap, which they kind of did in spring, and they've reverted, I would say, back to what they were previous years. That's not to say this series was bad from them. Photo Kanjuo were very good, but they're going into On and Vampire, who have been one of the worst spot lanes in the LPL. We'll talk about Vampire. I know people are a little bit excited about him. I'm not one of them. I'm not people right now, but Photo Kanjuo were good. Juo in particular was everywhere on the map, and Rookie was also fine. You know, I've seen people criticize the performance because Nenny was the only player on IG that didn't get destroyed in this series, but I think that almost defeats the purpose of, you know, what this series was. Rookie was sacrificing a lot of resources in order for Aki to play a lot more aggressive, for Juo to move around the map, for Shanji to be kind of the primary carry. In that second game on the Cassante, there was a lot of good, I would say, from NIP. All five members looked really solid here, and unfortunately for IG, basically all five members looked bad. Again, Nenny probably the only one where you're looking at and saying like, hey, he was fine, generally fine, didn't really make any major errors. Everybody else was pretty tremendously awful. I think you could give Dud of the series to any of them. I very much considered Zuyan for this. I don't think he was as bad in this series as maybe his scoreline would indicate, but he did get destroyed in the 1v1. Shanji was absolutely better, which is never ideal. You know, GLFS on, they were both not good, but Vampire is once again going to get my dud of the series. I, I just don't see it in Vampire. And again, maybe there is potential there as a player, but there was never any opportunity for us to know that because he just got thrown into the LPL right out of solo queue as a player who was clearly not ready for that kind of responsibility. It's one thing for JDG to take a player like Sheer to put him into a team that is very talented around him that, you know, has a lot of people that can kind of make that transition a lot easier. And also, you know, he's a top laner. Like, that role just generally requires less, like, pro knowledge. Like, solo queue does give you a pretty good experience of what playing top lane is like, and you can probably make that transition a bit easier. You can't throw a player like Vampire into a bad team that's never played competitive in the support role, a role that is so important to be on the same page as the rest of your team, a, a role that is so important to be, like, experienced at a pro level. Uh, it's just not going to work out, and Vampire has struggled a lot because of it. In my opinion, he is the worst player in the LPL. I know some people are excited about him. I know that there is some fandom around him. I'm not on the hype train. That should be very clear to anybody who's watched the channel over the course of this year, but I just, I don't see it in Vampire. I don't think he's a particularly good player right now, but Zuyan was also horrible. You know, GLFS, on like even on on who has been generally fine, I would say this split, uh, even his performances are starting to go down individually. This is just not a good Invictus Gaming team. They were number 17 in terms of my predictions for a reason. This is not a good roster, and I think I would be really shocked if they did anything other than just kind of lose out and be one of the worst teams in the LPL, but that's a good news for NIP because this was a free win and it gets them back on track. Remember, they just need to get top three in this group. They need to not fail harder than the other teams that are kind of failing right now. If they can be better than Ultra Prime and Weibo Gaming, which I think is very possible, if not entirely likely, then they're going to be just fine. I still think this team could theoretically compete for top four, but still a lot that needs to be proven against teams that aren't IG. And then moving on to our second series of day number three, 3-0 three versus 0-3, going as you would expect, Thundertalk Gaming taking on JD Gaming, and JDG does pick up the win, although it was 2-1, to one. Thundertalk actually takes game number one, they look pretty good with that game one draft, the brand was huge for them in that performance, and they were really able to play around that, but once they moved further along into the series, they just weren't able to keep that same kind of momentum up, and JDG ended up taking control. I think really the big crux for JDG is that their two carries, their two star players are playing at a really good level right now. They're getting good performances out of their other players, but you need those two to be performing at a top two level in their role in the region for you to be as good as you want to be. And so far, that's kind of been the case. This team was undefeated heading into this series for a reason. So we'll go ahead and talk about it. Player of the series is going to go to Ruler for me in the bot lane. I think he's playing so much better than he did in spring right now. And I, I thought he was okay in spring. Like, again, I don't want to criticize Ruler too much for this spring split. He was only bad because he had set the expectation so high because it's Ruler, right? We thought he was going to be the number 180 carry in the world by, like, a, a large margin. He just wasn't that in the spring split. He was just okay. He was, like, a borderline all-pro caliber guy, and that was a disappointment for Ruler, but he still was pretty good. He has been better in summer. He has gotten back to being Ruler again. He has gotten back to winning every single lane super consistently and being the best mid-game fighter at the 80 carry position in the world. Maybe at any position in the world. He still is incredibly difficult to deal with. The Kai'Sa in game number three was basically undealable with, and especially in Fearless 
this draft, I think Ruler has really adopted this style well. His champion, Ocean, is very well known. He has a lot of different styles that he can play. He's very versatile in the way that he wants to go about winning the game. He can just do a little bit of everything. Missing obviously contributes to that quite a bit, but I think Ruler has been the driving force for why this bot lane has gotten better so far in summer than they were in spring, at least on a consistency basis. And Kanavi still is excellent. Like, you, I don't want to, you know, make it seem like I'm trying to take anything away from Kanavi. He is one of the players that is leading the MVP conversation right now, as he does every split. Like, he was an MVP finalist last split, even with JDG being an underperformer, like getting third in the regular season or whatever people want to say is a huge disappointment for them. Kanavi still was, in my opinion, the best jungler in the world in spring, and I think he continues to prove that he is the best jungler in the world. I think the situation doesn't always present itself for him to prove that on the highest stage because the rest of this team isn't consistent really at all, but Kanavi Ruler, they are doing, they are doing their part. And I do like Sheer. I mean, he's going into one of the weakest top laners in the entire league in Hoya, and, you know, he, him beating him is not entirely surprising, but Sheer was excellent in the back half of this series. Of course, Skarner is really strong, and a lot of people look good on Skarner like Sheer did in, in game number two. He was probably the most valuable player in that game, but he was still very good in game three on the Cassante, and I think his development has come along again. We talked about it in the previous segment, but you know, typically I'm against just promoting players from solo queue to the LPL. It's a little bit of a culture shock in terms of the expectation that might be set on them, but top lane's a bit of a different position. It doesn't really require as much of the, you know, communication experience as you'll need out of a position like support or mid or jungle or even AD carry to an extent. And also, you know, he gets to play with Kanavi and Ruler and Missing and Yegao. It's not like he's struggling in terms of being able to get caught up to speed. Like, this is a very good situation for a young player to be entered into. And Sheer is adapting well. I think it's the right decision to continue to play him as upside is just too high. Yagao has been good this split. He's been better, much better in my opinion, in summer than he was in spring. I think this team is generally playing better right now than they did in spring, and that's exciting. This could be an easy top two team in the LPL. I know Top Esports is a team that I and a lot of other people believe in, but JDG, not too hard behind them. I think sometimes the conversation gets a bit out of control in terms of those two, but I do think JDG deserves their credit. And then for Thunder Talk, I know this team has their own set of problems, but this is probably the best series that they have played in the summer split by like a ginormous margin. They have been absolutely absolutely taken advantage of here in Group A. They have not been relevant, really, in any of the series that they played. Their bot lane has been really bad. Like, I'm okay with 1XN. I think he's, like, a serviceable LPL AD carry. I think people continue to talk about him a lot higher than maybe I'm willing to talk about him, but support has been a complete disaster, whether it's Chocho, whether it's Feather. It really has not mattered. Uh, both support positions have been, or both support players have been really bad for them, and they were not too much better in this series. We'll talk about that, but their biggest problem continues to be that they do not have a top side of the map. Hoya is going to get dead of the series, and, you know, I know that this is a really weird thing to start this off with. I know this isn't about him at all, but going back to the LGD thing, I keep seeing Bertle grouped with Hoya. What are we doing? Like, truly, you would have to be not watching the games. Like, that is the clearest sign to me that you don't watch the games if you think that Hoya and Bertle are on the same level, because Hoya is horrible. Like, Bertle is a, a pretty good, like, an average passable top laner. He will win really hard, and he will lose pretty hard, and you just kind of have to live with that, but for the most part, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Hoya sucks. Hoya loses every laning phase. They're not even in the same, like, vicinity. They are not in the same atmosphere in terms of their gameplay. Hoya should not be starting in the LPL. That has been proven over the last couple of splits, and when Sheer is taking advantage of you, that's just not a very good sign. This has been a very, very bad run for Hoya. I mean, he was pretty good in his first split on Thunder Talk, but ever since then, like, last year he was really bad. This year He's been really bad. Just not a lot of good signs. Um, Beishuan was really awesome in game one on the brand, but he was really bad in games two and three on the Lilia and the Karthus. I think he's been better somehow, some way in summer than he was in spring. He was horrible in spring. One of the worst players in the LPL. He has been passable in summer. But that's still, like, not good enough for this team to be relevant. Yukal is a good player. 1XM was generally fine. But like I said, Feather was horrible here. Missing Ruler were really able to take advantage of a lot of the over-eager, over-aggressive engages that happened on the other side of the map that ended up costing Thunder Talk a lot. So, uh, overall, Thunder Talk at least won a game. Like, that's honestly pretty impressive. JDG had been untouchable up until this point in Group A, so it's a nice win for them, but their issues are not going away. Like, Hoya and Feather are not getting better. And then for JDG, you know, Kanavi and Ruler are playing out of their mind. Sheer looks like He's developing well. Yagao, I think, is having a good split. Missing is doing fine. Like, this team is good. There are still some concerns for me that hold them back. They're not really ever being tested here so far. In Group A, like EDG, Fun Plus Phoenix, they've not really tested them in the same way that some of the other, you know, top teams are getting tested in other groups. But hopefully, if those teams start to play better, I think JDG could potentially prove themselves to be one of the best teams in the league. And maybe those teams are better than I'm giving them credit for. And JDG actually is just clear top two. That'll, you know, time will tell on that. But at least for now, JDG really has not had a ton of problems in this group at all. 
And then moving on now to day number four, our middle day for the week, and we kicked it off with a matchup between Edward Gaming and Fun Plus Phoenix, a very, very important one here in Group A, and FPX very importantly is able to pick up a win here. This really makes things a lot more interesting. EDG winning their first confrontation was pretty massive for EDG because it put them in a pretty good spot moving into the second part of this round robin to get themselves out of this group in the top two. That has not become as clear now with FPX picking up the win here. Uh, now both teams likely going to be sitting somewhere around 3-3 three and three at the end of the group, or at least that's what's projected. JDG probably going undefeated. I don't imagine Thunder Talk is going to pick up a win, but, um, you know, if that ends up being the case, then game record, like actual game score, is going to matter a lot. And that makes the rest of these games super important for both of these teams. So a pretty monumental and consequential win here for FPX, but it's nice to see them get back on the right track after all the controversy that they had surrounding themselves in the previous couple of weeks with everything that's been going on off the rift. It's nice to see this group of five has stayed together, that they've stayed as starters, and that they are still playing the style that got them into a good place in the spring split. Player of the series is going to go to Milky Way. He's not having that MVP-like season that he had in spring. I think generally speaking, he has been, you know, quote-unquote figured out a little bit more. He is somebody who is just super high resource, very feast for famine. When he wins, he wins hard. When he loses, he's not particularly useful. He's not a very versatile player, and so when you take him out of the style that he's very comfortable on, which is winning and playing for a head, it doesn't always go super well. Essentially, what we've seen is that when Milky Way plays really good junglers, it can sometimes be a bit more difficult for him to get those consistent leads because he's not just outpacing everybody that he's going up against. But when he wins, when he still gets ahead, he still is one of the most dangerous junglers in the entire world. Like, you do not want to have to play against Milky Way when he does have a lead or when he can control the pace of the game. And that's what we saw in game one in particular on the Viego. Game three was still very good on the Diana. I think generally speaking, FPX just looked really solid. And I think playing around Milky Way is their comfort zone. The reason I've been a little bit lower on this team is I don't feel like they have a ton of carries outside of Milky Way. That was a little bit not true in this series because Care was really good, was certainly the better mid laner between these two, between Care and Cryon. But Care has not been particularly good in the summer split here. He was really not good in spring either. This honestly feels more like an outlier in terms of Care's recent performances than it does the, like, rule. <laughs> it definitely feels more like an exception, which is fine. Like, you just hope that this is something he can build on. Care has really kind of underperformed in 2024, but this was a great performance. Cryon really struggled in terms of the 1v1 in the mid lane. Cryon was not good. We will get to that, and Care was definitely able to take advantage of that, which is something that he hasn't always been able to do for this team over the course of this year, but I need to see more than just one series of good play before I just anoint that Care is back. I was really high on him last year, but he really has been not good this year, and so it is good to see him play well, but I gotta see him keep it up. Zhao Lao, who was definitely the better top laner, good to see him kind of get his mental back after that whole situation, and Dectum and Life have been good for the entirety of the year. I think generally speaking, they have continued to be good here for FPX. I still don't think this is some sort of transcendent team. I think their flaws are still very exploitable. Again, they are very one-dimensional in terms of their playstyle, but that one dimension is very good. It's very strong, and they're going to win games because of it. And then for EDG on the other side, this is a pretty, you know, unfortunate loss. I think they felt pretty good after their first win over FPX. I think this was a team that kind of expected themselves to come in, win this, and, you know, more or less secure their spot in the upper two. That did not happen. They really underperformed in this particular series, and there are concerns for this team. I think obviously it was really cool to see Solo Kill have such a good week last week, but uh, he's not been somebody that has been consistently good in his time in the LPL. Very short stint, and he does seem to be headed in the right direction, but those inconsistencies are definitely still there. He's not a finished product by any means, and Cryon specifically did not play well here. He's going to get dead of the series. This was a really bad series from Cryon. I think he played really poorly in games one and three, and game three in particular, he got destroyed on the Tristana. He was not useful at all, and I know there are some conversations about Cryon being a player that has historic fallen off as splits have continued to go on. He's typically been better when he's new to a team, and then the longer he stays on the team, he, he does tend to perform a little bit worse. He's a bit of an Azir merchant as well as we kind of saw in that second game, but Cryon just needs to be stable for this team, because again, Leave and Wink already feel like such an upgrade towards what this team had in the bot lane last split. Wink has been a huge upgrade in the support position, and Leave is obviously talented enough to capitalize even if his consistency is still super low, and Jeje is playing better. It feels like he's comfortable, it feels like he's healthy, which I think is a positive, even if he wasn't perfect in this series. Solo kill has taken some steps. Cryon just needs to be good enough in the mid lane, and I think the rest of this team is talented enough to win some games, but this is an example of what happens when EDG doesn't play up to their standard. Like, they can get trounced. This is not a surefire top 10 team by any means. I've seen a lot of people just claim that this is like a top 6 or 7 team in the LPL. I think that that is a pretty ridiculous claim to make, and I think that was backed up here by this series. FPX was just straight up better than them. They played their style, and they were able to get over it because EDG just doesn't have that level of consistency. So, if FPX can keep 
keep this momentum up. I mean, they're at four and five and EDG is now at what? I think it's five and four. So like there really is no major separation between these two teams. It's really going to depend on how cleanly they lose to JDG and how cleanly they beat Thundertuck. I think that's going to really be a big determining factor. And if one of them ends up dropping a series to Thundertuck or winning a surprise series against JDG, that could completely change the trajectory of these two teams. They're going to be duking it out for that second spot. And uh, this series certainly makes that competition a lot more interesting. And then moving on to our second series of day number four, and it's another really important win here. It's OMG taking on Rare Adam, and Group C is really interesting because Rare Adam just keeps winning. They're above 500. They're at three and two for now. This is a really good place for them to be. Obviously, Group C felt like it would be probably the least close of all of the groups in terms of what we expected at the start of the split because LNG and Top Esports were at the top, and it felt like those two teams were clearly the two best teams in the group, but with LNG not really performing up to standard right now and Rare Adam continuing to win this could become a lot more interesting as we continue to move along and Rare Adam's in a really good spot right now I think this roster is incredibly good I think in contrast to OMG on the other side of this matchup Rare Adam did make their roster significantly better in this midseason whereas OMG made their roster worse and I think we're seeing the product of those two results in this series so let's go ahead and talk about it player of the series it's going to the king of summer it's Zhao Hao I still cannot believe that Weibo Gaming brought in Zhao Hao and then only played him in spring, where he has statistically always been worse. This guy pops off every single summer split. 2022 summer, he was all pro caliber. 2023 summer, he was all pro caliber. And 2024 summer, he has been excellent here for Rare Adam. He might be all pro caliber again. Like, he is the best player on RA, and he is dragging them here to potentially a top two finish in this group if everything continues to go well for them. He has been spectacular. This Graves game was unbelievable in game number two, just completely ran it, dominated every single fight, and he was good on the Lilia as well. He was not poor at any point in this series. Xiao Hao is just ridiculously good. And again, for a player who has consistently popped off every single summer split that he has played as a pro, to get rid of him right before summer, it's absurd. Like, I get it. Tarzan was available, and you can make the argument that having someone like Tarzan there could be better, and Xiao Hao obviously wasn't perfect in spring for Weibo. You know, there were a lot of reasons why they would have wanted to make that decision, but I still think it's ridiculous for, for Zhao Hao to be sitting here on Rare Adam as a player who clearly should be on the top, you know, four, five or six team in the LPL at minimum. Like, he is way too good to have gone backwards in terms of his career progression after finally being picked up by one of the big teams here in the LPL. And he is doing it again. He's the best player on a bad team. And I really, really hate that for him. It's not like the rest of this team is awful, just the expectations aren't quite there. But they are playing really well because of him. And everybody has gotten better because of it. I think the biggest recipient and somebody who has quietly been very good this split is Vikla in the mid lane. I know people love to hate on Vikla. Again, LPL fans uh, create their notions. They create their notions at the beginning of a player's career and then they never abandon them. They stick to those notions forever and LPL fans were like, we're gonna hate Vikla and they hate Vikla. Like, I get it. It's the same thing we've talked about in this video multiple times. Sometimes they choose to love a player and they will defend him no matter how poorly they're playing and sometimes they will choose to hate a player and they will criticize them no matter how well they're playing or they just won't talk about them at all when they are playing well. That's kind of the case for Vikla right now who has been pretty good in the mid lane. Maybe not a star, like he's not been sensational, but he has been pretty good here in summer. Certainly a positive for Rare Adam overall, and it's a really big upgrade to what he was in spring. I'm happy to, to bring up when players are doing well. That's definitely a lot more positive than me being negative about these players. But uh, Assume, Jue, Xiaoshu, like they're all good. They're all fine players, but Zhao Hao, Vikla, they really are kind of the carries of the team right now, and they're kind of putting the team on their back. Like Zhao Hao in particular really does feel like he did on AL for all those years. Like the soul carry and, you know, allowing the mid laner to really be in a more comfortable position. RA could be interesting off the back of that alone. And then for OMG, this team sucks. They got worse in the offseason, and this team feels completely morally, mentally, like, drained. They feel tilted. There's really no other way to say it. And nobody feels more tilted than Angel in the mid lane right now. He's going to get dead of the series. He's been pretty horrible this split, and it's just such a turnaround from where he had been in the last couple of splits. This reminds me a lot of RNG Angel from spring of 2023. I think some people forget about that tenure because he immediately went to ninjas in pajamas in the summer split and was excellent for that team dragged them to a playoff berth and then him and shadow dragged them to a playoff win i think a lot of people forget just how good he was there 
And to his credit, he followed that up with a really good spring split. Him and Xiao Fang had really good chemistry, and, you know, they were a borderline top 10 team for basically the entire split. They ended up making playoffs. They didn't do anything in playoffs, but they were there, and that's a positive, all things considered, but uh, he has fallen off a cliff. It feels like he is just tilted. He was running it. At points in this series, his game one on the court, he was genuinely horrendous, and it's not like he was much better on the way. In game number two, he just doesn't feel like his heart is in it right now, and if that's going to be the case, then they're going to struggle. Xiao Fang has definitely struggled because of it. He's actually had a really bad summer split so far. After showing a ton of interesting traits in the spring, hopefully these two can bounce back because right now they're just not playing well. Starry has been nothing but an unequivocal downgrade in the bot lane, and everybody could have seen this coming. I know that LPL fans love to sit here and, and anoint any new AD carry to the league as the next big up-and-comer. We've seen it for so many years with 1XN and Assume and Doggo, and you know even someone like Xiaoya is having that right now. Starry was kind of in that camp where everybody was just like, oh, he's going to be the next really good AD carry. Well, it turns out not everybody can be the next good AD carry. It turns out sometimes you need traits, and I'm not giving up on him just yet, but to expect it, to have expected him to come in and just dominate, like, I feel like I'm the only one who ever watched his LDL tape if that was the expectation for him. This was never going to be somebody that came in and was better than Abel from day one, and the expectation, I think, was that, and OMG is really suffering because of it. This team is at 0-5 because they're just not very good. They have downgraded in a lot of aspects, and the players that, was, that were carrying this team to wins, basically on their own, in the spring split, in Xiaofeng and Angel, and Angel in particular, they're, they've taken the split off. They have given up, and if that's going to be the case, OMG is going to be one of the worst teams in the league. And then for Rare Adam, again, Xiao Hao looking great, Viklo looking great, I want to see the rest of this team continue to get more consistent. Assume and Joy have been good. Maybe not excellent, just good. They've capitalized well on the things that have been created by the rest of the map, but they're not dominating in the 2v2 maybe like I would want them to. And then Xiaoshu in the top lane is a positive. I think if he just needs to continue to grow. Again, this is a player who has endless potential. He's just not really been able to harness it just yet. So RA is a fun and interesting team, and especially with LNG really struggling, this could be one team to watch for the upper group. And then moving on now to day number five. We're in the back half of the week here in week number three, and we've got another Group D matchup between Ultra Prime and Anyone's Legend, and it's a massive win for Anyone's Legend. They moved to five and one, and they've guaranteed themselves a place out of this group into the upper bracket. That confirms, at the very least, a play-in spot in the playoffs. Remember, if you're in the upper bracket, worst you can get is a play-in seed, and the lower bracket has to fight it out to see who else is going to get a play-in seed. AL is looking for much more than that. This is not just a potential playoff team. This is not just a team that hopes to make it a couple of rounds deep. This is a team that wants to make worlds, and honestly, right now, they are playing like a team that very well could make worlds. They are playing very concise, very clean, and even when they're not playing particularly well, I think the most encouraging thing is that one of these players can have an off day or, or a couple off games, and you've got more than enough talent on this team to be able to recover from that. It's not the end of the world if somebody doesn't play perfectly, and I think that that is a, really the sign of a team that could theoretically be very, very scary and consistent down the stretch. For Ultra Prime, obviously, it's a frustrating loss, but picking up at least a game win here on AL might be very important for them. Moving to 7 and 8 is really not a horrible place to be at 500, considering who the competition here is. They weren't expecting to come here and beat AL, but I think, you know, going Going down 1-2 is probably best case scenario, other than, you know, surprising them and, and upsetting them after that game number one. You know, game number two probably shouldn't have been won by AL. Uh, Ultra Prime had a pretty good lead in that one, but uh, I think generally speaking, they're going to be okay with this outcome if it weren't for how we ended up getting to this outcome. But for AL, let's talk about it. Player of the series for me is going to go to Croco in the jungle. I think a lot of people are going to want to see Hope get this player of the series because that game number three on the Varus was an electric closeout performance. I mean, he truly was sensational in that third and final game, but I just can't overlook how he was the worst player on AL in both games one and two. He just really was not very good on these more, uh, I don't want to say passive, but more supportive, less aggressive options in the Ezreal and the Senna. He felt a lot more at home once he got on the Varus, but he was not good in games one and two, so he's not going to get player of the series. Krako was the most consistent, I would say, across this entire series. He was integral in their game two win on the Lee Sin. I think if Krako had not been nearly as good on Lee in game two, they probably just go down 0-2 in this series. Ultra Prime is being looked at as a potential top five or six team in the LPL, and, you know, this entire conversation changes with a 2-0 win for them, but uh, Krako was very good in that second game, and the Lee Sin really was important. He was really good on Zyra as well in game number three. I'm not the biggest Zyra fan, 
fan, but it was still played well. And Krakow had a very good week overall. Both of their wins this week were really strong from the jungler here for AL, and I think that's a great sign. Again, consistency has really been the only issue for Krakow. It's the same issue that Shanks has. It's the same issue that Hope has. It's not really, uh, oh, are they going to be good enough on their best days? We know they're going to be good enough on their best days. Are they going to be good enough on their bad days to end up being a, a team that's competitive at the top of the standings? At least for now, it looks pretty good, but I do want to, you know, see them tested in a little bit of a heavier environment, you know? The rest of this Group D has been disappointing in some way, shape, or form. A lot of that is because of how good AL has been. They've been able to take care of their competition relatively efficiently, but I do want to see what happens, you know, when Krakow starts to lose. Can the rest of this team really rebound, and can Krakow just be more consistent? That's also something to watch out for and to monitor, but AL looked really good. Again, Hope was excellent. I think the rest of this team was underratedly good. Shanks was very good, even if he was a little bit too aggressive for my taste, I think, for the most part. Those plays ended up working out. Uh, Ale, kind of a similar story, you know, traded a lot in this matchup, but for the most part was just better than Ching Tian on the other side. And you know, I'm a big fan of Kale. I think Kale was underratedly excellent in that third and final game on the Ash, especially in the 2v2. He's not going to get the credit he deserves because Hope was excellent and he deserves the credit as well. But both of the members of the bot lane were excellent in that third and final game. So big win for AL, even if they almost bottled it here in the middle of game number two. And then for Ultra Prime, you did try your best. You're going to be frustrated that you walked out of this with a loss because it really did feel like you were on your way to a massive 2-0 victory over the number one team in this group, but you couldn't quite finish it off. And then game three happened and you let the Varus get fed and you're not really able to recover. I think a lot of people are going to point fingers at Doggo in the bot lane here and I would agree he's going to get dead of the series. Just not a good one from Doggo. He's so integral towards this team's success and I think the frustrating part is that Nickit continued to play incredibly well in this series that he was so excellent on the Leona, on the Rel in game number two. He was even good on the Alistair in game three. He really is kind of a sensationally good support. Someone that I could see being a top five, top four support in the LPL one day. Like maybe not now, obviously not now but like in a, like two years or something, could Nickit be like a world-class support? Absolutely. This guy has shown nothing but the ability to really excel even at a lower level of competition. And, you know, he's playing really well and Doggo's still not really able to be consistent in any way. That Ziggs game was an absolute disaster in game number three. And he was really bad down the stretch of game two on the Ash. He just has to be better. He has not been good enough for Ultra Prime for them to be able to survive. I think the rest of this team had their strengths and weaknesses. Hacker kind of got abused as this series continued to go along, but he was really, excellent at the start. Yuakai, again, also very aggressive, tried to match that from Shanks, and I think for the most part, it didn't end up working out. Shanks was just kind of better in this series, but, you know, there were some interesting moments. The Yone in game one was fine, and Ching Tian is still not someone that particularly excites me. I've been underwhelmed, to say the least, by him. I thought he was going to be a lot better here for Ultra Prime, and I thought if they were going to be even half as good as what they are, I thought Ching Tian was going to be a big reason for that. It is, they've been good in spite of him on the top side of the map, which I think is a bit disappointing, but Ultra Prime definitely has its clear advantages. Hacker, Yuakai, and Nickit are really good. Nickit and Hacker in particular have been excellent this split, and if they're going to be able to keep that up, I mean, even with this loss, like, upper group is still very reasonable for them, but AL locks themselves in for that. They lock themselves in for, at the very least, a play-in, playoff spot, which is something that this organization has been dreaming of trying to get into in the first place, the playoffs, let alone, you know, being a team that competes for Worlds, but they really do have the ceiling at their fingertips. Like, they really absolutely could reach heights that this orc has never even seen before, and for that, I'm very excited. Then moving on to our second series of day number five, and it's another pretty important Group D matchup. It's Ninjas in Pajamas taking on Weibo Gaming, and Ninjas in Pajamas are going to pick up another very important win. Weibo moving to two and four here at the end of their week number three tenure. This is looking dire for Weibo Gaming. It's about as disastrous as it could get at the moment. This was a team that some people, me included, had in their top four. Like, I had them as a projected Worlds team heading into the split. I did talk about reasons why I thought they could theoretically underperform. They are kind of built in a way... That would lead me to believe that they are kind of scary because they don't really have that carry, like that hyper carry guy who's used to having a lot of resources, but I thought the talent on this team would overcome that. It just has not. The communication has actually been terrible. <laughs> it has been really, really bad. These players are playing way below their skill level, uh, and that is not good for Weibo Gaming. It's pretty disastrous for them at the moment, but for NIP on the other side, again, an important win. Getting above 500 is really crucial right now because Ultra Prime is playing well. It really creates the situation where it is kind of must win for Ninjas in Pajamas at the current moment, but once again, it always comes back to one name when it comes to this team 
team, and that is Rookie in the mid lane. He either wins or he loses his team in the series. He has taken the role of captain and star on this team a little bit too personally, I think. Uh, this is going to be a player of the series performance from him. He truly was exceptional here, but when they lose, it is almost always because of Rookie as well. It is a very interesting dichotomy to kind of talk about NIP within the framework of because he is so integral towards this team's success, and yet uh, he hasn't really been hyper consistent. So the 4-3 and three output, I think, is pretty indicative of where Rookie has been. He's leading the LPL in player of the game votes, and he's also leading a me for player of the series votes, but he also has two dud of the series, and so he doesn't actually grade out like as this perfect player here, even if he does have quite a bit of accolades to go along with his successes. It's just a very interesting conversation. A rookie is just that important to ninjas in pajamas, but again, when he has games like the Tristana and the Quirky game here in 1 and 2, when he's going up against an opposition in Xiaohu, who has been a really bad, like significantly below average over the course of this split, then it's going to be positive for him overall. He has been very good for them for the most part. He was awesome in spring, an all-pro caliber guy, arguably a top five mid laner in the world in the spring split in terms of just performance. And, you know, he hasn't exactly followed that up with, you know, perfection, I would say, over the course of summer, but it's been good enough to get this team in a good spot. I also think that Shanji had a very good week. I know it's been a little bit of a struggle for him, but, you know, I think the good outweighs the bad when it comes to summer. The Mord, the Cassante, both games were really solid, and he was better than Breathe, who seems to have given up on this team in the same way that he gave up on RNG in the middle of last split. Uh, Photo and Juo had a really good week. Aki had a really good week. NIP, I think, generally looked good, especially in their wins, but Rookie really is the heart and soul of this team. When he wins, this team is going to do fine. When he loses, this team is going to struggle. It really is kind of just that, that simple for them. And then for Weibo Gaming... I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, it is just a disaster at this point. The communication is clearly off. These players are playing below skill level. Fingers can get pointed anywhere. Like, Breathe has been horrible. You know, dud of the series for me. He's going to go to Crisp for the second time this week. Like, he has been really bad this split, and there's really just no explanation for it. I think a lot of people are going to say that Crisp has been washed. Those people, again, have not been watching games. It's just really hard for me to believe that someone has that opinion, having watched Crisp over the past year and a half. He was one of the best supports in the world last year, and while he wasn't perfect in spring, he was certainly better than this. Like, this is not replicable. This is not indicative of where Crisp has been. Uh, you know, this would be, it would be results-based thinking to say that Crisp is just suddenly washed. I think there were a lot of problems on this team, and I think that everyone is playing worse because of it. I think everyone is getting dragged down by the team. I think they are all playing below their own skill levels. There's just not a lot else I can say. Light was generally fine here. Tarzan, I think, was honestly the best player on Weibo this week. There really just wasn't a lot for him to do. Uh, but Xiaohu has been horrible. He's losing every single mid lane matchup. I can't even remember the the last time he was genuinely a better mid laner in the series that they had. He's been not just a below average mid laner, he's legit been one of the worst mid laners in the LPL. Like, full stop. He has not been able to lane, he has not been able to translate it. Uh, Xiaohu is a player that I'm worried about in terms of, like, the future prospects. Breathe was really bad this week, and I like Breathe. I think he could still be very good for this team, but, you know, we've seen what happens when he's not motivated in the past. He can sometimes give up on teams, and that seems like what's happening here for Weibo. It just feels like everything is collapsing around them, and they are going to be in the lower group almost certainly. I'm not going to say that that's a guarantee, because anything can happen in the final a week of the season, but this is really not a good look for Weibo. They're sitting at 2-4, and four, and both Ultra Prime and Ninjas in Pajamas control their own destiny. Weibo might not even have a chance to get into the top uh, three of this group, which would be an absolute disaster, but for NIP, you know, pretty big win. It's, again, nice to get themselves to above 500 at 4-3. and three. This team feels pretty good about getting themselves out in the upper bracket. As long as you get out, none of that really matters. It just matters about getting out into that upper bracket, as Weibo knows all too clearly. I think this team will do just fine once they get into that upper bracket. They may not be perfect, but I I think they're good enough, and I think for now, at least the 4-3 and three record is going to be probably good enough to get them out. And then moving on now to our penultimate day here in the LPL in week number three. It's day six, and we kick it off with a pretty big upset here between Team WE and LGD Gaming, and this is a gigantic win for LGD. They win 2-0. to zero. They put themselves at 3-2 and two in the group, and more importantly, they move WE to 2-3 and three in the group, and now all of a sudden, LGD is in second place in this group. They could potentially be getting into Group A, which would be... Un incredible. I mean, that would be truly an unbelievable achievement for a team that has just continuously overperformed with every given opportunity. They have never once had, like, ridiculous talent or, you know, insane expectations, yet here we are with them kind of controlling their own destiny from here on out with a real shot to be able to make it into Group A over a team like WE who does have talent. Like, I will continue to die on the hill that Fofo is pl he's playing out of his mind. He's playing so well. He was really good in this series as well. He even got his signature Jace here in game number two. It just 
just doesn't matter. Everybody else on this team is kind of letting him down at the moment, and WWE just don't really seem to have a win condition other than Fofo in the mid lane, which is a disaster for them. So we'll talk about it as we continue to go along. But LGD, player of the series, is once again going to go to Meteor in the jungle. I really thought that uh, Fearless would hurt Meteor a lot because it felt like, okay, well, Graves and Kindred are just going to be gone. It's either going to be picked or banned every single game. It's not really going to have to be that much of a worry. You can't, you know, pick those champions in back-to-back -back games. Like, it's not something that would be that big of an issue. But Meteor has been able to consistently not only get one of either Graves or Kindred, I don't know, maybe because the enemy teams are just greedy. Like, I don't really get why you would allow him to have either. There's nothing else on this team that I think is, like, worth 100% banning. I think you have to ban Graves or Kindred, if not both, every single game. But he has been pretty efficient on other carries as well. The brand, obviously, here we saw it in the previous series on the Karthus. We've seen him be consistently good on the AP carries as well, which is very important in this particular meta. But again, I do criticize a lot of other teams that are playing into them for just not trying to take Meteor off of the things that he's kind of known for. It's very weird to see a one-trick get his champions. Like, Graves and Kindred just need to be perma off the board for LGD, and yet here we are, sitting here after game number one, and it's like, oh, Meteor dominated again on Kindred. Awesome. Like, yeah, it's his signature champion for a reason. Why are we still allowing him to have this? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna complain, but Meteor still played excellent. He got his one trick and played unbelievable on it. Game one was definitely a bit better for him. Game two wasn't bad at all. The brand was still very good in game number two, but I definitely think the Kindred was a little bit more standout-ish, as you would know if you follow Meteor's career. He's a Marksman Jungle player. It's just kind of what he does as a player, and so to see teams continuously give over these champions to him, it is a little bit perplexing in terms of maybe what the expectations are, but it's good to see him perform well. Again, another player that the LPL community kind of really likes. I think he's a little bit more limited than maybe other people would generally say, just because, again, he is particularly good at one style, but that one style does work if you allow him to have it. And then I want to give a big shout out to this bot lane. This bot lane was my source of pessimism for this team heading into the split. Xiaoya, Jin Zhao, they just didn't inspire a ton of confidence, but both of them are playing really well right now. Xiaoya has really developed into an interesting ADC prospect. I'm not going to try and sit here and pretend he's going to be perfect. He's not been a star for this team really outside of week number three here, but he was really good in week number three, and that's something to note. He is getting better, which is a nice development process. And then Jin Zhao in the support position here, he is who he is. He's going to have four to five games every split where he looks really good and the other 15 are going to be really bad. That's just kind of what you have to live with when it comes to Jin Zhao. Luckily, they're getting the good performances right now. Hopefully you can keep that up for longer than he's been able to keep it up. He has gotten better in terms of understanding the support role the longer he has been in it after the role swap, but the bot lane's been better than anticipated and they certainly are better than LP and Mark who are just a disaster on the other side of this. And then Haichao and Bertle are good too. Haichao is excellent. Bertle is still generally fine. Like, again, I don't really understand why people are so negative towards him, but here we are. LGD is actually a genuinely good team once again. Maybe not good, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but they're an okay team. They are a team that could theoretically make a run for top 10 if everything were to go right. I'm not sure they're going to be as consistent once we get into like best of fives, and if they do end up getting into group A, I don't think they'll do particularly well in there. I think group B is wide open. It's the weakest group in my opinion, but um, that being said, they are doing a good job of capitalizing on a group that is underperforming, and WE is a big reason why that group is underperforming, because their expectations were that they were going to easily get out of this group in second, and that is just not happening right now. Folks, Fofo is playing great. He has truly been exceptional for this team, but outside of him, it is no one. Nobody else is playing well. Even Wayward, who I really like a lot, is not playing well on the top side of the map, but everybody else we were concerned about, and those concerns have come to fruition. Dead of the series, and this one is going to go to Hang. He was actually on a pretty good stretch, I would say, considering he's never really been a player that I've hated. He's also never really been a player I've loved. Just a very risky player, very feast or famine. Another player whose like, motto in terms of the jungle is, if I'm winning, I'm winning, and if I'm losing, I'm losing. Like, it is very much no idea how to play from a negative state, no idea how to play uh, from a less than advantageous position, like just absolutely no idea what to do in the mid game, generally speaking. If he's ahead, you can generally translate those leads into other lanes, and that's a positive, but uh, he doesn't really know what to do when he doesn't have the same kind of tempo that he typically has, and he just loses hard because of it. Again, it's ego to pick Nidalee into Meteor's Kindred, and he got obliterated for it. Like, it's on him for that. And then LP, God, this guy is bad. Like, there is just nothing left for me to see. Honestly, just take him out. Put Prince back in for all I care. Stay is still on this team, but they feel, I guess they're just allergic to wanting to play him. Like, they are absolutely costing themselves a group A spot if they do not put Stay in. LP really has been that bad. Genuinely one of the worst players in the LPL at this point. There's just nothing else for me to see. Mark has really not even been all that bad. I think people are going to criticize this bot lane, but Mark has really not been a problem for this team at all. It's really just been LP's positioning has been horrible. His laning is horrible. All of it is horrible. He is a bottom 1 to 2 ADC in the LPL, and that has become abundantly clear throughout this split. There's just nothing left to see. So for 
WWE, they're tanking their own chances with some horrible management decisions, and, you know, Fofo's trying his best, but there's only so much he can do. And then for LGD, they are capitalizing on teams like WWE and RNG not having any sort of clue on how to win games, not having any sort of clue on how to run their own teams. This is a very interestingly run team. The coaches have done a great job getting the most out of their players, and obviously they've been pretty lucky with some of the drafts that they've gotten, but they've capitalized on that luck, and they might get themselves into Group A because of it. And then moving on to our second series here of day number six and another undefeated versus winless matchup here as we saw Billy Billy Gaming taking on RNG and it did go as expected. Billy Billy absolutely crushed them, although there were some hiccups here for BLG and once again, this team just doesn't feel as dominant as you would have expected. There's still a lot of time for them to turn it around, especially because the reasons that they are not consistent right now just don't feel like reasons that will last, like players are underperforming that are just too good to continue to underperform. Their track record is too long for me to think that they will continue to have problems, but we'll go ahead and talk about it as we get into it here. Player of the series is going to go once again to Elk down in the bot lane. He is very quietly on MVP pace. I know people are a little bit lower on BLG. Crazy to say that because they're 4-0, 10 one but that's where the LPL is at right now. That's the expectations for this team and, you know, for this region and for the best team in the region, but Elk is on MVP pace. Like, right now, I would bet to wager he's probably my pick for MVP if I had to give you one. I know we're, you know, way out, but, you know, early on predictions, like, Elk is a pretty good candidate, I would say. He has been the best player on what I consider to be the best team in the league, and Elk really has been dominating everybody that he's gone up against. He has carried over that form from spring into summer, and he has continued to be one of, if not the best AD carry in the world in terms of the performances that he is consistently putting out. This meta fits him really well. Fearless fits him really well. I think generally speaking, I'm just excited to see what Elk is going to continue to do if he can keep this pace up. It's going to be fantastic. On has also been great. Like, you're not a one-man show down in the bot lane. That's not really how it works. And so if Elk's playing great, On is likely also playing great. And that's exactly what we're getting here. Both of them are playing very well right now. Ben also had a very quietly great week. If you just looked at the KDAs, it probably wouldn't feel like he was excellent, but he did dominate the late games of basically every single game that this team played and was very integral in their wins. Ben is just consistent in that way. Uh, sometimes he can take some regular season games off. You know, I've said it a lot on the channel, but I'm not against Juice. It's a little bit of a different matchup, and he was able to really take advantage of the poor kid's first, like, real showing at a top level. Uh, Shun was also fine, but generally speaking, the concern here for BLG is that Knight really has not been Knight this split. He was kind of bad in this series, Tong Yuan was just straight up better than him for a lot of these games, and that's the reason I said, like, yes, they're struggling right now, but it's not something I would expect to really carry over, because if your concern is, oh, is Knight gonna be good enough to perform in big moments? Yes. Like, I'm sorry, like, this is not going to last. I know that there are a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, Knight is uh, trash, and clearly JDG won the trade, says all the people who I guess don't realize that Billy Billy won the finals and that JDG didn't even make finals after the trade. Whatever, man. Like, Knight has played bad for three games in a row okay, yeah, he's gonna be fine. Like, I'm sorry, I don't I don't mean to just completely destroy the narrative. Knight's gonna be just fine. He is going to be very strong. He's gonna be great in Group A. He's gonna be great in the playoffs. That's my prediction. That's my expectation. You know, if he ends up struggling more, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. If he ends up continuing to underperform, then it becomes a conversation later on down the line. But if your underperformance is you just not being perfect against Tong Yuan while your team obliterates everybody else on the map, I can live with that. Like, you're, I can, it's gonna be fine. I think Knight's gonna be fine. I think he will be... Uh, uh, he will he will rise back up, I think, as we continue to go along throughout the year. But Billy Billy, 5-0, 10-1. We're talking about negatives when it comes to them. This team has been nearly untouchable. Group B is a disaster outside of Billy Billy, and they have proven that they are just not even remotely contested right now in terms of that group. And then for RNG on the other side, this team is garbage. They are rightfully at the number 17 spot. This is the worst team in the LPL. I don't even think it's really all that up for debate right now. They don't have an uh, like, uh, avenue to win. <laughs> like Everything that could have gone right for them kind of went right in this series, they couldn't even take a game. Like, Juan Fong continued to play really well. Ming, honestly, was generally fine here on the Nautilus and the Rel, and that's kind of what you've been waiting for, is a good performance out of both members of the bot lane. Tong Yuan actually won the mid lane matchup against Knight. Like, that's about as best case scenario as it gets, and yet you still couldn't win a game against BLG. It's just disaster. Juice came into the top lane for ZDZ, and unfortunately, he's gonna get dead of the series in his first main series as a starter here just not good enough. Like, Bin is obviously being thrown into the fire. Uh, like, you're not necessarily being given the easiest opportunity as a rookie top leader coming in and immediately having to play against Bin, but uh, he didn't really survive. He didn't really do all that much in this series, and so he is going to have to get it. But again, I'm not, like, Im imprinting any judgment on him as a player for losing to Bin in his first real series here in the LPL. I'm sure he'll get over it. Way also continues to just be kind of a net neutral for this team, which I think is a net negative, all things considered, because he simply has to be better than that if he wants to live up to the expectations 
limitations that Reddit continuously has for him. So RNG's bad. BLG's good. Like, I really wish I had more analysis on this series, but I don't. We know who these two teams are, and they played exactly as they should. I'm hoping Knight is able to kind of get back into Knight form, and honestly, I expect him to. But at least for now, BLG is really not even being tested in this group. But that's going to bring us to our final day of LPL action here in week number three. And it is a good one. It kicks us off with Anyone's Legend taking on Invictus Gaming. Top of the group versus bottom of the group. And as expected, Anyone's Legend is going to pick up their sixth series win of the split. Up until this point, this team is just cruising with a 2-0 win here. Really not much else to say. This segment's probably going to be rather short because what do I say about AL and IG that I haven't already said? I mean, AL's really good. They're playing in the exact way that they have all split long. They are taking advantage of mistakes at an unprecedented rate. They are really good at capitalizing when the enemy team does anything wrong. They're not exactly the most proactive team in the entire world, but you have tools and you have players that are willing to go out there and try to make plays for the team. It just doesn't always work like that. I think for the most part, they are more reactionary than maybe other top teams in the league, but it ends up working out for them. And IG just don't have the skills. This was much more like what we saw out of Invictus Gaming in the first couple of weeks where On was playing really well and there was a lot of setup and, you know, Nenny wasn't running it down, but everybody else on this team was just a complete and utter disaster, and they just don't have the skill level to be able to compete, and so, you know, this was a pretty traditional outcome. I'm not, I'm not going to spend, like, a ridiculous amount of time on it. Player of the series is going to go to Hope. He was really good this week. I think that that is a very encouraging sign that everybody on AL is kind of leveling up with the rest of this team, obviously. Shanks was always expected to be great. Ale was expected to be great coming into this team. He was supposed to be the one to increase their consistency, and he has done exactly that, and he was really good in this series, too. We'll get to it, but Croco, obviously, we talked about him earlier in the week. He has leveled up in terms of what he's been able to offer. And Hope is the other player who I think is just playing significantly better now than he has ever since he left JD Gaming a couple of years ago. This is really kind of the best version of him. The Ziggs in game number one was devastatingly good. He was really good in game number two as well on the Ash. And generally, I think he was the most impactful across both games on this team. But Ale definitely deserves an honorable mention shout out for player of the series because he was also incredibly good in this one. Really controlled a lot of game number two. He was tactically inting in that game in terms of the pressure that he was creating him and Croco. Both are not going to be afraid to go for plays. They are both players that are very aggressive in terms of their play style, in terms of their decision making. But for the most part, because this team is so talented, they can get away with a lot of that. And because they're so good at punishing mistakes they're really never in positions where they're like getting punished super hard for theirs because they always kind of have the upper hand going into the mid to late game. So am I worried a bit about whether or not this team is going to destroy the best teams in the league? Yeah, I don't know if they have the skill level to compete with top three. It still feels like top three is just a league above everybody else. Billy Billy kind of being above the top two even, but um, AL is probably the best of the rest and that might be good enough for a world spot. Remember four seeds for the LPL at Worlds and so AL might be de facto the best team, you know, outside of the big three, which is really nice for them. And then for Invictus Gaming, they're just not good. Like, this is one of the worst teams in the LPL. I think, lucky for them, there are a lot of other teams that are also pseudo-worst teams in the LPL, uh, teams that are probably just a little bit less consistent than them, but uh, they're not far from being number 17. They're effectively number 17 here. On and any, we're generally fine, but like I said, everybody else is just a little bit lackluster at this level. Vampire, I also don't think was horrid. Like, he has been, he has had some really, really awful performances. This was not one of them. Uh, he was just generally whatever in this series, but the top side of the map is a disaster. Zuyan was horrible this week got destroyed in both of the series that IG played, just wasn't able to hold up really under any circumstance. Uh, he's not been particularly good. There are rumors that You Should Know Me is going to be coming back into the team next week because they couldn't actually find a trade partner for him. If they spent this entire split not playing You Should Know Me because they were trying to trade him only to not trade him and put him in after it's already been decided that you're in the lower group, that would be the most hilarious outcome that you could possibly get. Not that I think it would change all that much when it comes to this team's outlook. I still think they would have been one of the worst teams in the league, but just it's a little bit of a funny experience if that ends up being the case. On is trapped on this team, I think, in different circumstances. He could look good, and I think Nenny is an interesting player. He doesn't play like a star. Like, he doesn't seem to have the top-end, like, performances that would make you think, oh, you put him on a different team and he could take over, like, he could be a game-breaker, but he seems like someone who could theoretically be a serviceable mid at this level, someone who could survive for a team that's better than this, but, you know, GLFS, Vampire, Zuyan, they're not good enough. Or they don't feel like they are good enough right now. It just doesn't feel like it's working out for IG, and we kind of expected that. We knew this was going to be one of the worst teams in the LPL. We knew this would be the worst team in Group D, and they have lived up to that expectation. But for AL on the other side, nice win. They look really good. Six and one is really strong. They've confirmed number one in this group. Not that that matters particularly. They're in Group A. They're in the upper group, and that's all they've ever wanted. They're going to be playing for you know playoffs at this point. Like it's it's not really up to like the group stage is over for them. They just want to get some practice. So you know expect some different attempts towards the back half of this season for them. But so far, it's looked really good. 
And then moving on to our final series of the week here in week number three. It's another Group C clash between Top Esports and LNG Esports. And Top Esports is going to pick up the 2-1 series win. This isn't a surprise, but they do suffer their first game loss of the split. They lose game number one here to LNG. And generally speaking, while game two and games two and three were not particularly good, I think LNG is okay with a 1-2 loss here. TES has been untouchable in this group. The first round robin was literally perfect for them. And, you know, you don't really have to worry about too much when it comes to like, oh, we lost to TES. It's all going to be up to what LNG does in the final week of the season. They have an opportunity to get themselves out of this group even at two and three it is very possible for them to do so but they have to start winning now I, I think some people are going to be really alarmed by this loss and say that this is proof that they are not going to get out of this group this was a projected loss for them they did not expect to win this and I don't think anybody expected them to win this they absolutely can still get out of this group even after losing the series for TES 5-0 and this team already qualified for the uh, group A they were the first team to do so last week at 4-0 and they, they're far ahead of schedule they are dominating it's not close they're winning Wins are incredible. This team looks like it's a complete package right now. I get they lost game number one, and that's certainly not ideal, but it could absolutely be worse for them considering they were undefeated even in games up until this point. Player of the series is very easily going to go to Jackie Love for me. The dude absolutely dominated the back half of this series. Jackie Love Kaisa is famous. I mean, he's got a skin for it in the game. Uh, we know how good it is. The Ezreal was also excellent. Jackie Love is just so good at being able to compound resources. Once he's winning, it's almost impossible to try and shut him down, and he's even good at playing from behind because he is so risky. He'll pull back resources in situations where it's not necessarily easy for other AD carries to do so. I will still stand by him being like a, a borderline top three AD carry in the world, like somewhere in that zone. I don't know exactly where he lands, but he is absolutely in the conversation for being a top three ADC in the world. And Mako certainly helps that. Mako was also excellent in this series, especially on the engagers in the back half. The Alistair, the Leona, that was a lot more comfortable for him. He can play Braum. You can still play Ash Braum if you're Jackie Love Mako. It's just not really all that exciting. And I think it does take away some of the like consistency that this team is going to have because they can't they can't really rely on Jackie Love and Mako to win the game by themselves down in the bot lane like they can against basically anybody else when they're playing things like Ash Prom. So Ezreal Alistair, Kaisa Leona, it's a lot more consistent for them to actually just straight up win games on those picks. Cream was also phenomenal, especially in game number two on the Tristana. That really was an exceptional performance. I wanted him to be a bit better in the laning phase. He really wasn't all that great in terms of the 1v1. I think if you look at the stats, Scout was kind of dominating him in the 1v1 lane, even as quirky, especially as LeBlanc and game number three, but Cream was so much more useful in the fights that it genuinely doesn't even matter. 369 was unbelievably good, definitely better than Zika, who has really disappointed this split in Tion. Absolutely outjungled Weiwei, just a little bit more of a passive series from Tion as opposed to kind of the overall carry performances that we've seen from him. He was dominant in week number two. Um, but TES is great. Like, there's really not a lot of negatives I can give them. Like, maybe I wanted to see Cream win lane a little bit harder, but genuinely, that's like such a minor negative. This team was just really good this series, not a lot to say. And then for LNG, more good than I think people are giving them credit for. First off, Gala is phenomenal. Like, Gala is truly, he's one of the best AD carries in the world. I think him and Gumiyushi are interchangeable. Like, I think they're the same player. I think they have the same play style. I think that they are both very, uh, I guess, flexible in terms of how they can play. I think Gala's just stuck on a really bad team, and I think Gumiyushi's on a very good team. That should give you some insight as to where I think he is as a player. He's just not, he's too much, he's too good for this team at this point, at least where he's at right now. He gifted some free kills over to Scout, and they still weren't really able to do anything with that. That Scout is going to get done of the series. I don't know what's going on with Scout. I, he actually grades out a little bit better than the, uh, I guess, Reddit analysts would like to make you believe. You see a lot of conversation and talk online about how, I think I even saw a comment that said, has there been anyone more detrimental to their own team than Scout this split? Yes, by like a ginormous margin. First off, Scout's actually been pretty good in their wins. I know that people forget about the wins because it's a lot easier to focus on the losses, but when this team has one series, Scout's actually been really important and really strong in those series. He's just been really bad in their losses. I I actually think he's had a pretty comparable split to someone like Rookie, who I think is getting a lot more buzz. I don't think his good games have been as good, but I certainly do think that there have been good things. And also, if you're going to complain about something, let it be his skirmishing, let it be his fighting. His laning has really actually been good. Like, he has been an above average laner in terms of every single metric. He just can't convert it into anything, which I get is kind of superfluous. It's like, oh, great, you can win resources and then do nothing with them. Who cares, right? And I, I agree with that. Like, I agree with that sentiment. I just want to kind of throw it out there that I do think Scout's 
split so far has been kind of portrayed to be like by far the worst in the league. I think someone like Xiaohu is playing significantly worse than Scout. Like there are a lot of players that I think are playing significantly worse than Scout. A lot of the rookies coming in have been significantly worse than Scout. Like there are there are players that are worse than Scout. I think there are players more detrimental to their team than Scout. I, I do think that he was awful here and he is going to get done of the series because he was basically force fed resources by his team and then got absolutely destroyed in the mid to late game fights because he just, his positioning is horrible. Like his mechanics are terrible, but there are players worse than Scout right now in the LPL. Weiwei has also just not been good. This has been kind of a continuation of what they were in spring. These two continue to have completely conflicting play styles. It feels like Scout has been the one to try to adapt, and it's just not working. When Weiwei doesn't get these AP carries, like the Brand or the Karthus, he just feels completely off in the current meta. Zika is getting destroyed. Even though he was, like, fine, generally, in some of these fights, 369 was better, which I guess is expected, and then Hong was just whatever. He was playing engagers, and the team was losing. Gala is ELO trapped here on LNG. They still have more than enough opportunities to get themselves out of, of this group into the upper group in second place. And honestly, I'm still kind of expecting them to do that. I know that feels like a crazy thing to say. I think they should be better than Rare Adam. Right now, they're not in terms of the standings, but I think it should be possible. And generally, I'm not as pessimistic about this team as a lot of other people are. I think we might see a similar arc to what we saw last split where they get better as they continue to go along, if only because their competition just kind of tends to be a little bit easier. Top Esports is out of the way. They got to start beating the teams they're supposed to beat. And then for TES, I mean, they're already out in first. There's really nothing else to play for. They've only got one more series left. Um, they were looking to go undefeated. They're not going to do that. That's fine. This team is just on practice mode until they get into the main stage. Uh, they are pretty firmly number two in the LPL for me. I get JDG's been good, but Top Esports has been electric, and I think people are honestly at this point kind of underrating this team. All right, but that is going to do it for my LPL Summer Placements Week number 3 overview and analysis video up on the screen. The standings, we've had quite a few teams officially qualify for the upper or the lower stage. Of course, on the screen now, you can see a couple of columns, the first one being power ranking. That's where I personally power rank these teams from number 1 to number 17. The second column being changed. That's going to show how they have changed from last week to this week, so we can go over risers and fallers, and unfortunately, I don't really have a lot. This might shock a lot of people, but honestly, I don't freaking know where these teams land right now. I don't know how good any of them are. It's such an insular type of uh, format where they only play a couple of teams and those teams kind of know them pretty well. They get a lot of the week to prep for them. It's such a weird, like... How good are these teams actually? I don't really actually know. It's going to be a bit difficult to judge. All that being said, most of the top of the standings is inconsistent. And so if you see a team like WE still up at number six, if you team, see a team like LNG still at number seven, awesome. Do you truly believe that Ultra Prime is a better team than them? Because if you do, go ahead, man. But I'm just not convinced in that same kind of way. Do you truly believe that Rare Adam is a top 10 team? I'm not convinced. Like there is a lot that still has to be proven to me about these teams that yes, are picking up nice wins, but are picking up nice wins against teams that are underperforming their own expectations, and I would more than likely expect them to turn around. Think of power rankings in my eyes as who I would predict to win a matchup if going head-to-head. -head. I don't think that that's necessarily as cut and dry because matchups matter. Like, Weibo Gaming is probably not going to beat a team like Ultra Prime right now. Not that they have a chance. They've lost to them twice already this year, but like, do I think that Weibo Gaming could be better than them? Yeah, I, I think they should. Like, would WE beat uh, Ultra Prime right now? I would sure hope so. Like, and I think that's my barometer for where I would put them in my my power ranking. So that kind of explains it because there are very few changes. The you know, top four are all staying the same. I feel like they have locked themselves in as the four best teams right now and the four best, you know, the four group leaders. I think that that's relatively fair. Ninjas in pajamas jumps up to five. You know, even with their inconsistencies, they're still significantly better than the other teams that are around them because WE was at five. They now fall to six. LNG is going to stay at seven and Ultra Prime is going to jump all the way up to eight because they've beaten Weibo Gaming twice. Like at this point, it would just be crazy for me to rank them below them. I think it's still reasonable to think that Weibo is a better team team than Ultra Prime because they should be a better team, but right now they are just not. I'm still going to show them some grace and put them at nine because it would be a shock if they weren't a top 10 team. If they even like, if they go into the lower bracket and don't win the play-in stage and get into the actual playoffs and get into top 10, that's still going to be considered a disappointment, even with the record that they have now. And that's kind of my barometer for why I keep them at number nine. They're still expectationally a top 10 team. And so I'm going to rank them as such. And then rounding out the top 10 is Fun Plus Phoenix. They beat Edward Gaming and they, you know, put themselves back into the top 10. I'm happy for them there, but EDG is going to fall down a couple of spots to 11 with that loss. They didn't look particularly good in it. Rare Adam, LGD, they are on the barrier. If you want to move either of them up, like both of them could very feasibly make Group A. Both of them are in Group A at the moment. You know, if the season were to end at before week four, then they would be in Group A, which is crazy to say, but... 
I don't think that they're going to be teams that do well in Group A. I think they're going to be teams that are lucky to get there because of some other underperformances, and then all the bottom four teams are just a disaster. Uh, OMG, Invictus Gaming, Thunder Talk, RNG, whatever order you want them in, they are horrid. Like, they are not good teams, and you can really put them wherever you want at the current moment, whatever order in the bottom four. I'm just keeping it the same from last week, but um, of course, that's going to be my power rankings. Let me know if I should have made more changes, because truly, I think the only comment I'm going to get, you know, on the power rankings is X team is too high. I, I think that's going to be fair and if you think x team is too high let me know the team that should be above them do you genuinely believe that a team like lgd should be listed above we because they beat them or do you think that in a rematch we would be favored like let me know what you think of that down in the comment section below genuinely curious like do you think that you know ra should be favorites over lng like a genuinely curious what the public and like what the general consensus tends to think on those topics but that's my standings and my power rankings let's move on to my player of the week and my dud of the week here in week number three player of the week maybe a bit surprisingly gonna go to meteor the jungler for lng LGD Gaming, I know I just spent some time saying like, oh, they're the 13th best team in the LPL, but they're not playing like the 13th best team in the LPL, or they haven't played like the 13th best team up until this point. Meteor was gifted a lot of really good situations. Do I think that this player of the week is replicable? Probably not. I think that this was a pretty dream week for him. Not only did he get a couple of, you know, opponents that are really struggling right now in RNG and WE, but they both allowed him to have some of his most proficient champions, and the meta does kind of fit into where he's at. I think in different circumstances, he might not be as consistent, but I can't deny the performances that he put out. He was the best player this week, at least the most valuable in his individual performances. The runners up, you know, very good runner ups. Uh, Elk here for Billy Billy. Hope, the AD carry for anyone's legend. Both of those teams were excellent, and Elk really is on MVP pace. Hope really carried AL in a lot of the games that they ended up playing, but Meteor to me was a little bit more consequential towards his own team's success. Again, do I think it will happen more frequently? Only if teams continue to give him Kindred and Graves, which I don't think is going to be super consistent, but my dead of the week, unfortunately, is going to go to a bit of a channel darling here. It's going to go to Chris. He was horrendous in Weibo Gaming. Basically, as a whole, who gets this dead of the week, they are just atrocious. Xiao, who is atrocious. Breathe was atrocious this week. Like, there just isn't really anything to talk about when it comes to Weibo. They are crashing and burning everywhere right now. The communication seems to only be getting worse, and the individual performances are suffering because of it. I don't really know where this team is going. They could flame out and get 15th, and I wouldn't be shocked. Or they could figure it out, you know, get into a playoff run and end up finishing, like, 6th or 7th, and I would kind of be like, okay, that's probably a reasonable outcome. I think both are real realistic possibilities for Weibo Gaming. I just, the direction they're going in right now is a disaster, and Crisp is going to get Dead of the Week for it. Meteor is going to get Player of the Week, though, for Week 3. So that's going to do it. I do hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like. It really does mean a lot. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We post about the LPL every single week on this channel. Of course, next week is the final week of the placement series before we jump into the upper and lower brackets, so that's going to be right around the corner. We're covering that on the channel as well, but we also cover all of the other major regions, the LCS, LEC, LCK, every single week on this channel, as well as the NACL, Tier 2 over in North America. So if you're interested in that stuff, hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.